So, how do you see me? But is it you that we see? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it is, <laughs> it's my attempt at kind of forming my own subjectivity um, in relation to the artificial intelligence, in relation to the system that's looking at me all the time. Um, yeah, what is me? I, I but that, that's, that's the point I want to explore a little bit, mm -hmm. because perhaps what we say, me, or this subjectivity that we're trying to explore, is already an algorithmic construct, construct mm -hmm. before any kind of algorithms are being applied. Because you have to ask yourself, what is the face? You know, no one is born with a face. You may be born with a head, but mm -hmm. the face is a social construct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when the newborn child looks at the face of the mother, they start to learn to read various, um, th th they read of it, whether they are in danger or whether they are safe. And well, these days, mothers, uh, instead of looking at the baby, they look at the phone. And that actually mm -hmm. changes the way the child's brain develops. Mm -hmm. um, so the face is not a given, the face is, I also think that the mm -hmm. face is culturally specific, not all cultures have faces. So it is already an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So what I think this work allows us to perhaps understand is that in our attempt to uh, comprehend the world and ourselves scientifically, we created a sense of self which uh, is inseparable from this scientific understanding. You know? And everything that is not scientific is being suppressed. Mm -hmm. And that, in a sense, what the algorithm shows us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly what I try to understand. Um, so by trying to look in to the systems that structure my experience all the time. I mean, so, I mean, to maybe put that in other language, um, we become increasingly used to using cameras that detect faces, for example, and we change our behaviors and in ways that relate to that experience, whether that is about how we hold a camera or how we focus, um, whether that's about covering the camera, Whatever it is, there's a multiplicity of behaviors that come from living in this situation where we are constantly um, being looked at and being looked at in a certain way that, that frames us, that frames, uh, that frames the face, that frames a certain identity. And knowing that I am living that way, I mean, observing myself and observing how I change and how my sense of myself changes and how my relationship to my technologies change. I want to try to look in to understand that more deeply and to understand how those structures might on some level reflect something about how I see myself and how I see others. So trying to look into this um, normally obscure or hidden system to get a sense of what's actually happening there and how that is shaping the sense of identity or the sense of relationship. And that allows us to also perhaps think about the, the photographic moment here because the kind of the work can suggest also that the the photographing a face is not, my, while it, have, it might have some visual similarities with, let's say, a portrait in a classical sense, mm -hmm. but in a sense it's doing something entirely different, even if on the surface, and that's the operative word here, if, even if on the, on the surface it remains identifiable, but what happens once you peel off the surface, what's beneath? Beneath there is, it seems to me, 
that is just another surface. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's surface all the way down. Mm -hmm. And that's what the photograph, in a sense, is showing us, that the whole traditional notion that there is the surface and there is depth is being obliterated by the photographic moment. All there is is just surfaces. You peel one off, so you, you take a, 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 a scraper or a sandpaper and you, and you scrape the surface of the table and underneath, voila, is just another surface. And same goes towards um, about the human body. So all, all there is is just a, a layered surface. In a sense, that is, is the, the gift of the algorithm. It reveals to us something of our own nature, which is not necessarily something natural, but something that we constructed because we, at some point, took this awful decision to comprehend the world mathematically, mm -hmm. scientifically, algorithmically. Perhaps the decision was taken, I don't know, 500, 600 years ago, maybe 2,000 years ago. Um, I don't know, but now we're really leaving the finale. Mm -hmm. So we, we finally can see where this is bringing us. And this is fascinating. So mm -hmm. we are kind of mesmerized looking at the fruits of our labor. And looking, at, yeah, looking at ourselves. <laughs> yeah, look, 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 looking at the way our own approach to uh, existence obliterates existence, and it is mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. It's 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 better than Netflix. <laughs> Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, so we talked a bit uh, bef when we, so we, we've talked before and <laughs> we um, chatted a bit about the portrait and I wanted to ask you actually what you think a portrait is. Well, what a portrait is, is a really big question, but <laughs> what, a, what a photographic portrait mm -hmm. is. I think what I wanted to say is that the photographic portrait is not the same. It's not like a debased uh, Rembrandt, you know, that anyone can do. It's something else entirely. I think that the, the photographic portrait is, um, is about the form of subjectivity that is produced in this specific environment, in this specific context, under these slides, in, in this mm -hmm. milieu. In a sense, it acknowledges the, the fleeting nature of subjectivity, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, I think, I think um, if there are art historians there, someone might say, well, that's exactly also what Rembrandt is doing by painting a portrait every decade and showing that there is no one Rembrandt, but at every stage of life, there is a different person looking back at you. Uh, perhaps, you know, the Manet, famous um, paintings of the cathedral in Rouen, uh, when he made like 16 different versions, show you that there is no cathedral as such. All there is is impressions or discourses or variations. But with photography, I think it's even more pronounced because that's where we can see what this technology of image making can teach us about our own being. Because our being is not separate from the technologies we are using. It's the technologies that, that make us. And it teaches us that we don't have a kind of unified sense of self or kind of, kind of solid identity that we carry with us from childhood to, to, to from the cradle to the grave. Rather, it is continuously changing on the fly. So, so this continuous uh, state of surveillance mm -hmm. um, can, it, it can be successful precisely because we already submitted to understanding ourselves as data. Mm -hmm. And it's this um, dual surveillance. It's this, uh, there's the two things, at least two things going on simultaneously. The one is this um, kind of surveillance that feels like an invasion. That's uh, the part of surveillance where um, you don't want people looking. So you might not want to be looked at by cameras on the street, but it's really, that's also a totally subjective personal thing. Uh, when you uh, want to be looked at and when you don't, 
and how that feels. Um, so when you point the camera at yourself and uh, ask to be looked at uh, on the one hand, and maybe when you someone else points the picture at you without you knowing, and um, and that act on the other side, and the the kind of slipperiness around that, and the the different um, the ways that that works also with our desires to be seen and to um, to try to figure out who we are actually and to try to make some kind of identity come out of this experience that we have. I think that's very interesting. Uh, we, I think we also spoke about it briefly. This gesture of lifting up a phone and the, in the new phones, they kind of unlock themselves by, uh, by recognizing your face. But this, this action of presenting yourself for inspection to a device, um, it's a, if, if you're familiar with um, SNM, with sadomasochism, then it's, it's a very, there is a very distinct mode of the, in the way the submissive person will present themselves to the master. You know, you present yourself for inspection and you are completely visible. Uh, and this, this maximum visibility, uh, I think, that it has some, it has a, some, obviously we desire this submission. You know, we want to be surveyed. We want to be uh, observed and captured. And it's very important that the, this observing device is completely opaque and unknown to us. It's this all-seeing master's eye that we have no way of returning the gaze to. And there is, a, of course, an immense pleasure in this form of submission. It removes all responsibility from the person who submits. All life decisions are transferred from the submissive to the master. So then you, are, you remain in this state of complete weightlessness. Uh, and there is something incredibly attractive to that. Um, that's what Freud, I think, calls the death drive. And, um, and the death drive means that for something to become intelligible, it first has to be, sen be experienced sensually. Um, so, what I think is kind of missing from many of the discussions we had here today is how does it feel? Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be in this moment, you know, which is algorithmically controlled and, and you know, um, uh, quantified and, and data, but but what is the, the actual experience? And the experience, I think, is not unpleasant. You know, it seems to me that we really like it. Um, and we like it because it is annihilating. Um, and, uh, and there is a certain, uh, there, there is a certain um, erogenous, uh, sensual, erotic pleasure in this sense that we are, we created an environment which consumes us and, um, and in that we, in a sense, uh, achieve our life's goal, achieve our life's journey's aim as a, as a human species. So I wonder what happens um, when the, um, so you point out that this has to be a kind of mysterious act that we are seen, but we don't understand how we're seen. So I wonder actually what happens if you do understand how you're seen. I mean, if you have your, uh, you have, you know, take your picture, take your selfie, whatever, and then in, let's say instead of uh, it being saved as a picture, or maybe on the way to being saved as a picture, you see how you're disassembled into data. Um, you see an abstraction of yourself as a, as a mathematical vector. I mean, if you see yourself turned into, you know, maybe um, some squiggly line or something like this. I mean, it, is that does that make it unappealing then? No, it doesn't make it unappealing. <laughs> but, but you know, it's ashes to ashes. It's data to data. <laughs> uh, we come from data and we return to data. 
Uh, that, that's what I was trying to say. We constructed our life in, in the form of data very long time ago. So now when algorithms come and deconstruct our faces and mm -hmm. recognize them and learn them and process them, um, they only do that because we set ourselves up as data very long time ago. Mm -hmm. you know, when we decide, when we made this uh, decision, if we're going to study the world scientifically, comprehend it mathematically, quantify, catalog it. It was said here earlier that uh, uh, cataloging is human, um, or something like that. Classifying. Um, class classifying is human, and I guess it is, but it's also human to destroy your own humanity. Mm -hmm and destroy the humanity of others. I mean, so, yes, I mean, so I think it is, I mean, so this idea that, that we made this decision, I mean, so of course it's these uh, dominant powers that made these decisions and that made the decisions to classify others and that um, subjected people within those decisions and it is a it's a complicated position in which we find ourselves for that reason because I mean as we have been discussing really all day I mean so the politics of classification filtered into everything I mean more or less explicitly throughout this day and there is something complicated and really important to sort through there between um, trying to throw things out that we don't want or trying to regulate things that we don't want or trying to deconstruct things and also parsing out if there is something there that can be saved. I mean, so does the whole thing have to be um, thrown away? So do we just say, okay, this entire technology is really bad, comes from a bad history, has been used for purposes of power and control, and should actually just be thrown out? Do we try to go backwards? Or is there some kind of forwards? Is there some place to go that recognizes the deep problematics and the very dark histories and finds something past that. Well, I think there is something past that, but in, in order to arrive at the past, at, at this point, when there is some kind of um, opening and some sort of direction, um, we first need to understand what is going on. So, mm -hmm. one thing I want to uh, point is that the question of power is, of course, key here, but the power is not something that is exercised on us from outside. Mm -hmm. We are also the power. You know, so I'm sorry to uh, mention uh, a philosopher in, uh, in uh, this setting, but uh, Heidegger, in his essay, The Question Concerning Technology, um, did speak about the way technology is not just a tool or a device or a mechanism, but something much deeper. It reveals our relation to the world. And if we live in an environment in which the relation to the world is technological, and our relation to ourselves is technological, then we need to understand that what we, um, what we understand as life is itself already technology. So for that reason, it's not like we need to, you know, somehow free ourselves from the algorithm. It's not more possible, it's just not possible. It's like it's not possible to start breathing, uh, you know, cream instead of air. Um, but we need to understand what kind of relationship we have with this environment. So for, at least for instance, the question of when you say, um, how do you see me? The question of what, what is me mm -hmm. becomes really important. Is, is the sense of me and what we know about data and algorithm, are they two opposite things that are opposed to each other, or are they the same thing? You know, because I think in this context about something like Dolly the sheep, which is clearly both a, new, a, a, a living being and technology. 
and I think none of us is that different from those leadership. So if life and technology are deeply intertwined, then we might be able to understand our environment in a, in a different way. Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> Um, the, I mean, it might be interesting also to think about this idea of representation. So I know that um, actually that you and Katrina have written about this um, in relation to photography, thinking about representation. And I would be curious what you think about this idea of the, of the model. I mean, where you think that a, a model sits in relation to representation as it's traditionally understood in, in um, art history, for example. Um, you know, so we have um, this training and this exposure to examples and then this um, generalization that occurs and that is meant to point to something that's meant to um, stand in for some group um, and then at the same time, it is doing this thing that's really different from how we've ever understood representation before because um, there's so many things inside the model that kind of appear there um, as part of the process of training. So there's so many things inside suddenly what is pointed to as a category that, um, that we didn't put there, that kind of are in between, but also, you know, as I'm pointing to with these strange pictures, I mean, that are totally out of nowhere, seemingly. So you're saying that the algorithm produces various unpredictable artifacts. Exactly. Or un unpredictable images that we didn't put in. Exactly, it represents somehow something that doesn't exist. And, and, but the, and yet it does exist in a strange way. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of material immateriality of the algorithm. And that, I think that, that, that is interesting and will take us about six hours to, to, <laughs> to unpack. But um, I think it goes back to um, Godel's undecidability theorems that also uh, um, are the foundation of um, Turing's paradoxes, uh, of, or the paradox of the Turing machine, the so-called halting problem, which is about um, a basic kind of conceptual model of, of the computer, which there always will be situations about which it's impossible to predict in advance whether the answer will, whether the program will, will run indefinitely or whether it will stop. That's the famous halting problem. It's also, in philosophy, it's known as Russell's paradox, the sets of all sets. Um, but basically what it means in, um, in kind of a very essential uh, dimension, is that the algorithm will always produce unpredictable outcomes as part of the program. And so the algorithm has its own creativity. And mm -hmm. so, so these, uh, sometimes they're called noise, you know, like this compression of the JPEG image, uh, which always distorts the image study. But if it's impossible to predict in advance, which pixels exactly mm -hmm. will get distorted. That's, that's the, the, the unknowable dimension of the algorithm. But that also, I think, um, Luciana Parisi gets into that quite well, in, in well, brilliantly actually, in the Con Contagious Architecture um, book, how uh, the algorithm has these powers to generate new creative um, moments. So in a sense, the algorithm is the life force. That's kind of connected to the, the point we were already labeled in the beginning that life and data are not two separate things. It's not like you come to life and then start quanti to quantify it. You know? It's it's a much more nuanced relationship. We just need to stop thinking within these Cartesian binary frameworks. We all the time want to somehow understand what's going on by saying, is it mind or is it the body? Well guess what? That is just not not, not going to happen. It's something else entirely. It's this immaterial materiality. And I don't know if we have the time to sort of mm -hmm. unpack the politics of it. That would be fascinating. But it's just important to point out that the, the group of philosophers who find that the most rewarding way of thinking 
are the cyber feminist philosophers like Donna Haraway um, and Karen Barad. What you see in this stepping away from the Cartesian binary, the possibility of a philosophy that is not um, kind of anchored in, in dominatory masculine uh, hierarchical mm -hmm. structures. And this is exactly what I wonder. I mean, in thinking about um, classifying as human, if we can't actually find a different way of being human, I mean, if we recognize that this is uh, something that we don't want, actually, can we envision a different way of being in the world? Can we envision uh, a different kind of science or uh, different ways of, of relating uh, to ourselves and to others that remove that classifying act. Yeah, maybe that's subtly exactly what the algorithm can teach us, because the algorithm, even this classifying algorithm, keeps throwing up unpredictable results. Um, and so creativity is not in, is not in calculation, it, but it's also not outside of it. Um, and while, uh, while cataloging is, and, and, and quantifying, systematizing is human, we also need to bear in mind that what we always fail to grasp with, with, in this approach is precisely the difference between the quantified elements. Yeah? So for instance, you type Mona Lisa into your Google search engine, and you get a whole an infinite screen of Mona Lisas. And that makes you realize that the question is not which one of those is the authentic or which one of those is the most closest to the original. The, the, the question is completely different. It's not anymore about original and copy. It's about what makes this multitude of differences possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, can seeing that a, ca that a so-called category of, of something, let's say, of, of, of a face, of pictures of a face, um, to the AI, for example, to see that that category contains so many things that don't look anything like a face to us, can that, uh, but that it functions, so that it's not saying that the thing doesn't work at all. I mean, of course it does. It works sometimes well, sometimes not well, depending on your face, etc. But if you see that this category um, of, of, of you is filled with things that you don't understand, that don't make any sense, can that uh, break apart the act of classification? Can it maybe show us that perhaps even though we think that we can't operate without that, um, that maybe it's totally arbitrary? or not totally arbitrary, but that maybe it's not totally necessary to do that, or that maybe there's another way of seeing exactly the same things that functions just as well, um, but isn't how we would see it. And if you can see that there's so many different ways of seeing the same things, can that break then out of uh, this, this politically very problematic act that, that is fundamentally at the base of ideas of rationality and um, civilization. I think the danger is in, somehow in thinking that the, the face is simple, the algorithm is complicated. The face is just as unknown to us as the algorithms that manipulate. The face is already cold. And um, the, the face is produced only when the head becomes separate from the body. So that's the Cartesian moment. Mm -hmm. So without the Cartesian privileging of the head over the body, we also wouldn't have the face. So, so that's already a piece of code. That's already some kind of... So, so, so decoding the face is, in a sense, just as essential as um, decoding the algorithm. You know, or, or, uh, and instead, the algorithm reveals something to us about its inner workings by offering an image. For example, for that reason, I think that your work is very interesting because it gives us a visual access. Very few of us uh, understand or can, can really understand the algorithm mm -hmm. as, a, as a piece of 
in architecture or code or software, but we all can get something from an image. Mm -hmm. So when we see this, um, the imprint of the algorithm in a visual form, and it would be also interesting to ask why visual? Mm -hmm. Why not as a sound? Why not as a smell? Why not as a movement? Yeah, because all of this uh, seems to me possible. We somehow have come to realize that that the face is um, the face is already sort of it's it's a body that is being coded. Yeah, in the same way, that, for instance, when I lift my hand with a fist like that, it becomes more than just a hand. It becomes all something else in the hand, it becomes a gesture. It already gets deterritorialized, to use sort of the, the Deleuze and Guattari term. It becomes, it becomes detached from the body, it, it becomes symbolic. So the face is already symbolic. I think that the perfect image to sum that up uh, is actually this picture that I showed of the facial detection of these totally disembodied faces. <laughs> I mean, it's really exactly that. Mm -hmm. Um, these portraits that I've made that are just a face and nothing else, no body, and how those are equally detected and equally recognized and given a kind of proxy identity within the, within the algorithms, within you know, my Apple identity. So across all of my devices, these kind of phantom identities exist there and, um, and persist and are always suggested to me as people that I want to you know, reminisce by looking at the pictures of these. And they're exactly this. I mean, they're just the face stripped of anything else. And isn't it interesting that we have this conversation in the photographer's gallery? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, this context of you have photography. To ask yourself why this context, you know? Why uh, this context and not another? And mm -hmm. also, what, what are the the broader context, you know, the sort of the, this West End media hub and then Soho and then the whole sort of um, London environment of the of this, this surveillance metropolis in King's Cross where I, where I work. There mm -hmm. is now facial recognition used uh, throughout the Granary Square even though uh, it was denied. Mm -hmm. um, um, and facial recognition is really how this city seems to operate. Um, and then we are in this photographer's gallery. So what is the connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it, thinking of the context of photography is, is really interesting. I mean, this um, kind of first very technological art form that uh, was um, marginalized or maybe still is marginalized within the fine art world um, and the parallel of that to kind of tech art and the marginalization of tech art uh, let's say starting in the 90s and then continuing and then kind of where are we now in that so we're in a place where um, so photography which was marginalized kind of has its own world and is a bit it, but but also was consumed into the fine art world, but it still has places like the photographer's gallery that are totally devoted to it, to bring it recognition or to bring it um, some kind of standing. And then the photographer, um, the f kind of the photography world, in turn then marginalizes the, <laughs> the technology, the later technologies of so the technology art that's come later has very little place or very little space allocated to it within even the context of that. And um, so there, it's, I think it's really interesting that that, that happens actually, that, that photography doesn't more often recognize the total continuation of it as a, as a technical medium, and as a technical medium that is so incredibly socially relevant at this moment in time where everyone is taking photographs and everyone is thinking about themselves and shaping their identities as reflected through the image. Um, it's such an opportunity for photography to think about its own status and to kind of invite people into thinking through the politics and the social relations of technology and image making um, in this moment. See, so it is very interesting, as you say, uh, photography is 
precisely at this moment. So fascinating, it offers so many rich insights. Um, and you kind of have to ask why, what makes it so fascinating? Because it is a very old technology, you know, it's of the age of the steam engine. And if we don't find the steam engine as fascinating, you know? <laughs> um, so, um, so what, and I think the question, the, the, that, that really becomes quite significant. It, but there is this um, chronology here, which mm -hmm. is from five century BC, uh, the mm -hmm. first oh, yeah. uh, <coughs> camera obscura. But I think the history of photography goes much further back because you really have to think of photosynthesis as the technology that allows life by capturing light, converting it to sugar, and using this sugar as a source of energy. And that, in a sense, is a photographic process. And perhaps in f with photography, um, <coughs> we really are exploring what life means. And because, mm -hmm. in, because in, in photography, in the photographic image, the technological and the visual, the social, the sensual, and the philosophical can never be split asunder. As metaphysics always wanted to keep things, you know, you have ethics, you have aesthetics, you have politics, you have, and, and in photography, the separation is impossible. The moment of exposure brings all these things together and fuses them. And perhaps that really allows us a glimpse of what life can be like once we abandon precisely the classification I really wonder what happens next also. I mean, so you see these prototypes of phones now that are literally covered in cameras. I mean, so where you have the entire, you know, back surface of the phone is just cameras. Um, so <laughs> when you push things to such an extreme, I mean, have we already reached a kind of climax in this photographic culture? I mean, certainly in terms of selfie culture, it seems like that kind of peaked and something different begins to happen. and. I mean, will we just take more and more and more pictures, or will that morph into something else? Um, I make no uh, <laughs> claims about the future. That makes me very nervous, this kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. I no guess. Problem. Uh, okay, so I'm afraid we don't have time for, <laughs> for our questions. Yeah.